safety finances, tips for funding your fish farm. I'm Nicole Wright, an extension educator with Ohio Sea Grant, and I'll be today's host. We have four speakers with us today to provide state, regional, and federal programs and resources for fish farmers. We have Steve Narig, Senior Financial Officer with Farm Credit Mid-America, Joan Benjamin, Farmer Rancher Grant Program Coordinator and Associate Regional Coordinator with North Central SARE, Andy Jermalowitz, Director, Business Development Division, USDA Rural Development, and finally, Tim Sullivan, National Program Leader of Animal Production Systems, USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Before we start today, it's important to acknowledge that the Great Lakes watershed encompass the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands and waters of indigenous nations. As original caretakers of our region's lands and waters and life beings, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and the complex history and experiences in this region. Briefly, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative and what we do. The collaborative, or GLAC as we call it, is a partnership among the eight, lake, eight Great Lakes Sea Grant programs in the states you see highlighted in light blue. For those of you not familiar with Sea Grant, we are a federal university partnership between NOAA and a university in each coastal state. Our mission is to bring science to our communities to solve problems. The goal of GLAC is to provide science-based information and activities that support an environmentally responsible, competitive, and sustainable aquaculture industry in the Great Lakes. We use a variety of methods to reach our goal, including convening state advisory groups, who then inform webinars like this and events such as the summer's Great Lakes Aquaculture Days. We have a research component with researchers asking relevant questions to expand our knowledge of aquaculture and its impacts in the Great Lakes regions. And we maintain a website. We can find recordings of our virtual webinars and events and information about what's going on with aquaculture in the Great Lakes region. This past September, we also launched a tool for consumers to find fish sellers. The Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder is a mapping tool and sortable business listing for wild caught and aquaculture raised fish and seafood products. I encourage you to check it out and if you are a fish farmer or commercial fisher to be added to the site. Finally, a special thanks to the rest of the CLAC webinar committee. And then some tips. Um, if you have questions, please enter those into the Q&A box. Chat is um, reserved for networking and sharing resources. Um, if you have any issues behind the scenes, you can directly chat with Christina Dierkes, who can help you with any technical issues. So before I turn it over to Steve to get us started, we're going to launch a quick poll to better understand who our audience is today. We're especially interested in how many non-farmers or farmers are here, and if you are a farmer, where you are in your business. So we'll give you a few seconds to complete this. Okay, so it looks like we have almost an equal number of non-farmers and potential farmers, followed by beginning farmers, and lastly, a small group of experienced farmers with us today. Okay, and with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Steve so that he can start us off in talking about state and regional resources for farmers in funding and financing. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, my name is Steve Nairg. I'm a senior financial officer with Farm Credit Mid-America. I am located in West Central Indiana. Farm Credit Mid-America has offices throughout Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. We offer a full service of agricultural financing, which includes operating loans, 
equipment financing, leasing, and real estate financing. Um, I really don't have a presentation for you other than to, to be here to answer questions about what programs we offer and how we could help um, finance your operations. That's really all I've got, Nicole. <laughs> all right, well, I guess to give it, get us started, um, what financial advice would you give to those looking into starting or, or those who have started a fish farm? Well, again, the, the biggest thing for us to have is, is a good business plan with, with detailed projections or records of what you've been able to do or what you expect to do. Um, and, and understand that, that Farm Credit is, is a lending institution that is a government-sponsored entity, um, but unlike FSA, our money comes from bonds, and, and so uh, we're going to look at it from a profitability standpoint for the operation and, and, and how that operation can generate income to, to repay that debt. I guess to get us started, can you walk someone through if they are wanting to come to Farm Service Mid-America, what are the first steps? Do they go to their website and find a local agent? Do they talk to someone on the phone, go to the office? What types of materials do they need to have ready when they talk with someone? Well, generally, I would, I would encourage you to go online and find a, an office near where you're located and then reach out to the office and, and explain, hey, I'm either have a fish farm, I'm looking to start a fish farm or whatever that way, and set up an appointment so you can meet with a, a loan officer and discuss your plans that way. Um, and then when you come into the office, what it would be nice to have is a, a financial statement prepared for yourself and your business that business plan that explains what you're doing or, or what you hope to be doing. And then any historical earnings you would have, we typically look at tax returns. And if you're a starting operation, you know, I'm assuming you're gonna have income from other sources to help support you until you get your business up and running that way. Okay, so when someone walks into the office, do they need to show income to qualify for financing? No, I mean, if, if their proposal is to put together a fishing operation that, that's going to generate income, we can look at that projection as, as your income source to qualify to borrow from us. Okay. Are there certain um, hurdles that aquaculture fish farmers face um, that other types of agriculture maybe do not because it's not as um, practiced as often? Yeah, Nicole, that's going to be the biggest thing. You know, if you're a, a, a hog farmer, a cattle farmer, and you come in, hey, we're, we're real familiar with that. Um, you know, I know of a, you know, there's a tilapia farm in the next county over from me, and I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with them. But again, that's, that's one in I, I'm a handful of those in, in the state of Indiana. And so having you having a business plan and being able to explain what you're doing or what you plan on doing and having the numbers that support that will be, um, you know, really key in being able to put something together that works for us and works for you. Hmm. So if, if someone is just considering getting started, what type of homework would they need to do in order to put together that plan? Well, I think they're going to have to have reached out to the universities and other people involved in the, the business to, to be able to put together a good plan that way. Um, and then it, it, for someone that's starting out, we'll most likely have to look at either the, the USDA or somebody to help support or guarantee loans that way, unless somebody has a a, a parent or other financial backing to help support them. And can you talk a bit about, um, for farmers at any stage, whether they're just getting started or are, have been in the business for a while, what types of things can they seek loans for? 
Well, we provide loans for, for your operating needs, your, your, your daily needs for utilities, the food, employees, um, loans for equipment, whether that's tanks or pumps or um, any type of equipment you utilize that way. We have a leasing program that would allow you to uh, finance either that equipment or, or the real estate. You know, let's say you're building a, a building to house your, your fish tanks um, and you have a limited amount of equity that way. That lease might allow you to, to be able to finance those buildings um, in order to help get you started that way. And, and then we offer conventional mortgages. Um, and if you've got the, the equity in the land that you're going to build the building on or so forth, that's a, another option to, to finance something on a longer term to, to help ease the cash flow for a new startup operation. Do you have any advice for people in terms of whether they should, um, where they should be seeking advice or funding um, from? Like, is there a difference between going to their their bank down the street for farm service or farm credit? Well, uh, you know, the farm service agency uh, is, is government supported and government backed, and, and and they have the ability to do things that that a traditional bank or farm credit doesn't have the ability to do. Um, so, if if you're starting out um, and have you know, don't have somebody behind you to help support you, a parent or somebody, you know, that's probably going to be the direction you're going to have to look is towards a, a government type loan with some type of grant or something to help get you going. Because um, unless you've got a, a, a partner, a spouse, a coworker, somebody that has that financial support, you know, you're going to have to not only be able to, to provide the living, but you have to get the business up and going. And so that's going to be key. Um, and, and with the FSA type USDA loans, there's the ability to help cover some of that or take some of that risk. Mm -hmm. So are there different types of programs that you offer? Well, again, we offer the different types of loans. We don't have any, you know, whether you're a hog farmer or a fish farmer, we don't have a specific loan for those um, agricultural industries, but, but we offer loans, like I say, for operating that would be short-term needs that would be paid, you know, used for, for short-term needs, but we would be repaid out of your, your sell of your, your fish. Um, or we have longer term loans, say a five year loan for equipment purposes. And then, then those real estate loans for those longer term building and improvement type purchases. Okay. Um, do you have any examples that you can share with us of working with a fish farm and what they were seeking funding for? Well, I worked with one that, that was actually building a building and then inside the building they have tanks where they raise the fish and so forth. And so they were, they were looking for a, a complete startup type um, system that way. And were they able to secure that financing they needed to get started? Well, they, they ended up getting it from a, a local bank to finance them. Um, they, they ended up using farm ground to, to secure that debt with. And so that's the thing, you know, when you look at going out and borrowing that money, whether it's farm credit or the bank, you know, they're going to need something to, something kind of solid to tie that to. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, either I, neither I nor the bank are going to have a lot of familiarity with a fishing operation and they, they're not near as common as a cash grain operation or a cattle or a hog operation, which we've got good information that says, hey, here's how much our expenses should be, here's how much money we can make. And so when you put together a business plan, there's a little bit more to base that on. Whereas if you're raising, let's say catfish in, in, in tanks or whatever, there's, there's gonna be a lot less information out there to be able to base a decision on and know, hey, what kind of sales or what kind of um, 
market there is for, for that operation. From our audience, do we have any questions that you'd like to enter into the Q&A for Steve directly that he can answer while he's here with us? And Steve, um, are the different folks in your um, offices, you're very place-based, is that correct? So someone should be reaching out to someone that is in their area? Exactly, exactly. I'm, like I say, I'm in West Central Indiana. If you're in, if you're in Western Ohio, you know, don't call me. You need to call, you know, the office that's located in a county near you so they can, you know, it's convenience for you and convenience for them to be able to see your operation to work with you and, and, and help you achieve your goals. Okay, and we'll put that website in the chat so people can can see that and um, search in their area. Um, as you mentioned, it's harder for folks in aquaculture to maybe find some of those numbers um, for the economics of the industry. Do you have any advice? Um, um, are, are people in your position able to help farmers kind of before they come to you with their business plan? Is there any guidance in terms of how to find those elements to put into their business plan? Or should they work mostly with university and extension folks for that? I think the university and the extension people would be the, the starting point for trying to put together that business plan. Um, we've got a young beginning farmer program that has a, a business plan that you know, if somebody contacted us, we could give that to them. But, you know, it asks questions for you to think about, hey, what am I going to do if something ever happens to me? Who's my backup? What kind of insurance do I carry? Um, how does that impact my operation? So, so those are all things that you need to think about when you're, when you're putting together that business plan, because that knowing what will happen if something occurs helps relieve the, the questions that the bank or farm credit has because they know you thought about if something happens, you know, here's what what will take place. And can you explain the difference between a loan and a lease? Well, the, the, the biggest difference in, in, in the way I look at it, a loan, um, we're going to go out and, and appraise some equipment or some real estate. The, the nice thing about the lease, let's say you're building a, a, a 60 by 100 building to, to put your fish tanks in and whatnot. Um, the, the ability to get an appraisal on a building like that is, is, is pretty difficult because those buildings don't exist out here. The nice thing about the lease is we'll use the invoices for the construction of that property to set our value for that building. And then we can set up our, re our repayment on that lease, whether it be monthly, um, annually, you know, I assume if we're selling fish on a regular basis, we'd look more to a monthly style repayment, but we can set that up for that cash flow to match when you're gonna be receiving cash. Um, and again, we, we avoid some of the struggles with collateral on those buildings and those items that way. Okay, I'm gonna toss you one more question and then we're gonna hand things off to Joan and then we'll okay. have more Q&A at the end. Um, someone says, I see on the Fish Finder site, you mentioned there is a pond management company listed. Is funding from these sources typically available for companies that go beyond fish farming? but are related to aquaculture, plant growing for aquarium tr trade as an example. You know, that would be getting more outside of what we can do or what we're um, set up for. Because if you're growing plants for, for an aquarium or whatever, that isn't an agricultural production. And so that gets outside of where we're, what we're set up to do. Okay, well, thank you, Steve. Um, we will turn it over to Joan next and then return for a group Q&A at the end here.
All right, hello everybody. I'm Joan Benjamin and I'm with the North Central Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education or SARE program. And I'm gonna to talk to you about SARE grant options that are available. I'm located at Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. Most of our staff is at the University of Minnesota in St. Paul, which is our host institution for North Central Region SARE. So, what I'm going to do first is explain a little bit about what SARE is and then go over the grant programs that we have available. It's SARE is part of USDA. It's funded by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture or NEFA program. And its purpose is to provide grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. So farms of all sizes. And this PowerPoint will be made available to you along with the notes. So you'll have that available afterwards. SARE has a different setup. It is run by four regions. It's, it's a national program. So we cover the North Central, Northeast, South and Western regions. And each of those regions is guided by a volunteer administrative council. They make the grants and set the priorities for their region. So each region may have slightly different grants. They have different timelines. So if you're in the Northeast, you're gonna to wanna to look at your Northeastern SARE information to, to make sure you have accurate information for yours as opposed to the North Central region. All of our review teams who review the grants and the administrative council who runs the grant programs are made up of farmers and ranchers, ed educators, researchers, and personnel from state and federal agencies and business. So it's a really diverse group and farmers and ranchers are always involved, which makes it a uh, a really different perspective that's very open to new ideas. This is the SARE model and something that if you apply for one of our grants, you're going to be needing to address, which is that sustainable agriculture is has three parts to it. It's ecologically sound, economically viable, and socially responsible. So that's got all those three parts. And even if you apply for a grant and your project focuses mostly on one part of this, we still want you to look at the whole picture and address each of these three areas. SARE, SARE Outreach is our national outreach arm. And so they work with all four regions to share the information from grant projects because that's a big part of what SARE does is trying to get this information out to other farmers who are working on projects so everybody can benefit from what you're doing. A grant does not have to be paid back. So this is, uh, this is what you contribute is by sharing what you learn from your grant project with others. Um, you can find all of this information on the SARE website, www.sare.org. And what they do is produce books, bulletins, um, which are available for free download or with the books, you can order them for a small fee. The bulletins are free. You can also find all kinds of online materials like YouTube videos and topic routes on specific subjects. So lots of information there. And also reports from all of the grant projects that have been funded are located on our website at projects.sare.org. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it has, you can search all of the reports and this is something we really encourage you to do. So if you're applying for a grant, we want you to see what's already been done on that topic. So you aren't reinventing the wheel. And um, as I mentioned, one thing that's very important in this program is that farmers and ranchers are involved at, when in your case, aquaculture farmers, and you would uh, need them to be involved from the start of the project. This is just a brief look at some of the things that have been funded through the SARE program, but there's much more than that. And these are our six grants that are available through the North Central region. The other regions have similar grants, but may have one that we don't have. We have a youth educator grant, which other regions don't, but most have some kind of a farmer rancher grant, partnership grant, uh, research and education grant, professional development and graduate student grant. 
So you can see what the regions are here and you would just contact your region going to SARE.org to find out about the grants that are in your region. So the one that is probably gonna be most relevant to you is the farmer rancher grant. And the way that we define a farmer is someone who raises crops or livestock, especially as a business. So for the North Central region, it, we define livestock as vertebrate animals. So if you're working with fish, they would be considered livestock. If you're working with shrimp or something like that, they would not be considered livestock, which makes a difference in your budget. The farmer rancher grants are not for startup costs. So what they are is to help you solve a problem on the farmer ranch using sustainable agriculture practices and then share that information with others. We have two options available. As an individual, you can apply for up to $15,000 for a project. And if you have a team of two or more farmers from separate operations, you can apply for up to $30,000. We fund about 40 projects a year to the 12 states in the North Central region. So if you have a business or a farm or a ranch in the North Central region, you can apply. You can do uh, research or education with these, but you can't do things like uh, put up a permanent structure. The Farmer Rancher Grant is the only one of our grants that's open at the moment. And what happens is it's due December 2nd. So if you're trying to get one of these in, there isn't much time. So you would need to do that very quickly. What you would need is to fill out the online application. And there's a link at the beginning of this presentation that takes you to a PowerPoint that takes you step-by-step step through applying for a farmer rancher grant. There is a series of questions that you answer. There's also a budget that you need to fill out on what you want to set, spend the grant funds on and then justify that, say how you came up with that figure. And then you also need a letter of support, which is from someone in your community who can explain why this is important uh, work and why it should be funded and you know, what the benefits are to the community as well as to yourself. Once your proposal is turned in, we have a review team of 30 farmers and ranchers from the North Central region representing all 12 states. And five of those will, re will read your proposal. That group then meets in person and they make a recommendation to our administrative council who makes the final funding decision. And those uh, decisions are made in February. So that's when you would have an answer by and you would know if you were going to be funded or not. Even if you're not funded, you get the comments from the reviewers back, which can be really helpful if you apply again in the future. Okay. What I mentioned before is if you're going to be doing a project, it's really good to search our database, which is at projects.sare.org. And, and try and find out if something has been done on this before. So you would look, you would go to the search projects area and you could type in under project reports, you can put any kind of topic like aquaculture. And then you can say, okay, I just wanna search the North Central region or a specific state. And you wanna look at all the farmer rancher grants that were done. And when you search on that, here's what would come up. Here's a listing of some of just a few of the aquaculture projects that have been funded in our region. The way this code works, this FNC stands for Farmer North Central. So that's a farmer rancher grant in the North Central region. 20, that's 2020 is the year it was funded and this is the grant number. So you'll see the title there. If you click on these links, it will take you to the report. If it's a recent project like this one at the top from 2021, their reports aren't due till the end of January, so no reports in there yet. But um, there's, if you do such a general search, just aquaculture in our region, you'll see there's, there's many different projects that you can look at and get some ideas from what's already been um, funded. And, and that you can build on so that you can um, take advantage of the work that's already been done. And, we, and don't just look at SARE grant work, but also look at research that's done by others. So you really can build on the research that's already out there. 
these particular ones, projects that are shown here were for projects in Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, and Wisconsin. But you have the ability to search the, the entire country to see what kind of reports have come in. Another grant that might interest you is the partnership grant. This one is closed for this year, but those are grants for on-farm research demonstration and education projects, and they are for up to $40,000. They're run by an ag professional, and an ag professional is defined as an extension educator, other university educators or researchers, nonprofit organization staff, agency staff, certified crop advisors, and other ag and natural resource consultants. So they're the one in charge of the grant and they have to work with three or more farmers on the project. So that's a, that's a good one if you want to work with a group of farmers and, and maybe someone from the university. Another grant that I coordinate is our Youth Educator Grant Program. This is to teach young people about sustainable agriculture. And we, through this program, have funded some on aquaculture, but also a number on aquaponics. And these are to help young people and their parents see sustainable agriculture as a viable career option and help them learn about sustainable agriculture. These are very small grants of just $6,000, but they're open to educators with a very broad definition. So anyone who teaches young people about sustainable agriculture is qualified for this program. This one, the applications were due November 11th, so that one is closed. And we usually fund about 15 of these a year. The research and education program is our biggest program. Those are for grants of up to $250,000. And these can be a research project or an education project. We also have a new option looking at long-term research. These typically go to organizations and we fund 14 or 15 a year. Um, those have a two-stage process. So they, your first you have to turn in a pre-proposal. That deadline has already passed for this year. If you make it through the pre-proposal phase, then you're invited to submit a full proposal. So these are more complicated and also much more competitive because of the higher amount that's available. In this case, um, funding decisions would be made in July and then the funding would become available in November of 2022 for this current round. We also have professional development program grants. These are basically train the trainer grants. These haven't opened yet, but when they do, they'll be due in April of 2022. Those are for up to $90,000. And finally, we have graduate student grants. These are for currently enrolled graduate students, and they actually need to write the proposal and lead the work on the project so that they can get experience with grant writing as well as carrying out a grant project. Those are um, for up to 15,000, that call for proposals has not been released yet, but when it is, those will be due in April. And about 22 of those grants are funded each year. So if you're looking to apply for one of these, a good place to start is with your SARE state coordinator. Each state in the United States has at least one SARE state coordinator. For the North Central region, if you go to our North Central area and you'll see Sarah in your state and you click on that and it gives you a list of all the states in our region and you can open that up to find who is the state coordinator in your region. They often put on grant writing workshops and have other help available to you. And another source that you might want to explore is through the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. They have a free grant and financial assistance advising program for farmers and agricultural entrepreneurs in the Midwest but this is only open to these 12 states in the North Central region. So they can help you apply for grants and loan and cost share programs. And so um, this is one that you really might want to look into. And finally, you can also check with ATRA. This is the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Service. They keep a list of grant opportunities on their website and the link is listed there. And there are also two other links here. One is for building sustainable farms, ranches, and communities. And that is an online resource that with a guide to federal programs that, can, that might be able to help you find funding and also a grassroots guide to federal farm and food programs, another online resource for federal programs that tells you what the basic requirements are and the grants available. 
So that that is it um, in this PowerPoint. There's also some grant writing tips, which I'm not going to go over, but you're welcome to look at later. And so um, here's some contact information if you have questions. Thank you, Joan. We are gonna turn it over to Tim and Andy, and then we'll return to all of you for questions at the end. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Nicole. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Jamalowitz. I currently serve as the director of the business development division within Rural Business Cooperative Service. Um, just a quick uh, overview of uh, rural development. We are one of the eight mission areas that make up the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we're comprised of three agencies, Rural Housing Service, Rural Utility Service, and Rural Business Cooperative Service. And through these agencies, we offer loans, grants, and loan guarantees to, to help create jobs and support economic uh, development and essential services in rural communities, such as housing, healthcare, uh, first responder services and equipment and uh, essential uh, infrastructure facilities like water, electric, and communications. Um, oops. Uh, uh, we do this through a portfolio of over 40 programs uh, that support uh, rural communities in the most recent fiscal year. I believe we put out over $50 billion in rural, rural America, and we do maintain an ongoing portfolio of investments that exceeds $220, $220 billion. And not surprisingly, uh, we are often viewed as a bank for rural America. And just now, just a quick uh, how we're structured. Uh, while we do have a strong presence in Washington, D.C., uh, really, I believe the strength of our organization is our network of state and area offices. Rural development supports 47 state offices and over 400 area offices. And I, again, I believe one of the strengths of our organization is our staff live in the communities that they serve. Um, there is a rural development state director and staff in each of these rural development offices to assist you with any detailed questions you might have on any of the programs. Uh, you can find the contact information for your state office on the USDA Rural Development website at www.rd.usda.gov. And so again, I'm with Rural Business Cooperative Service, so I'm going to focus on those programs. And of those 40 programs I've mentioned, probably 20 of them reside in Rural Business Cooperative Service. And here is a listing, just a listing of some of the programs that we do. Uh, again, just given the audience here, I'm gonna focus on a few that um, are really direct and specific to um, aquaculture and fishery projects. Um, so, Typically, uh, you know, USDA is fairly um, structured and a lot of times on the production side is with Farm Service Agency or NRCS. And so RD is mostly a program delivery agency and we support communities, businesses, um, universities, um, nonprofits, et cetera. However, um, you know, over the years, we do have a couple of programs that where our our audience are producers, and I'm going to focus on those two programs here this afternoon. Uh, the first being our Rural Energy for America program. Uh, this is both a loan and a grant program uh, that can support uh, new renewable energy systems and uh, energy efficiency, energy improvements. Uh, on the renewable energy, we're, we're agnostic in terms of the you know, type of renewable energy. It could be solar, wind. Uh, biomass, uh, anaerobic digesters. So there is opportunities there on the renewable energy system side. And again, I think a big one for ag producers and rural small businesses are the energy efficiency and energy improvement. So we can provide some grant funding to support upgrading and lighting. Say for instance, you're upgrading from fluorescent to LED, uh, upgrading an HVAC system, uh, installing new fans, uh, you know, if it's in the field, it's uh, upgrading a, you know, irrigation system. So there is a lot of opportunities in this program, very broad, um, and it's, I would argue uh, flexible. On the grant side, um, we're looking at 
uh, grants for projects can be up to 25% of the total project cost. And on the loan side, it, the loan, the guarantee piece can be up to 75% of the total project cost. So when I shift again, this kind of outlays it here a little bit better. Uh, when you're looking at renewable energy systems, say you have a $10,000 project, the REAP grant could cover uh, $2,500 of it. So there's the minimum amount of a grant is $2,500. Grants can go up to $500,000. So there was a large project. Um, you, could, you could offset some of that cost through the REAP uh, on, on the, excuse me, that's on the renewable energy systems. On energy efficiency uh, or energy improvements, you can see the maximum minimum amount of grants here again. And on both cases here, uh, the REAP grant can be for up to 25% of the total eligible project cost. Uh, if we switch over here to the to the loan component, you'll see here that we can do a, a significant amount of financing for these. And again, by financing, I'm talking we come in, we work with the lender to provide the loan guarantee. Uh, good examples of this project may be a community looking to you know, uh, erect a solar array. Um, it could be uh, a you know, group of or, or a large dairy farm looking to uh, install and operate an anaerobic digester that's going to need this type of, of capital. And again, on these, uh, the loan guarantee, the port portion that RD will come in there to work with is 75% of total eligible costs. Again, I, re re I do encourage you to reach out to your um, you know, identify and reach out to your RD state office. The REAP program is currently open. Um, we, uh, the program is open for application. There is a component of this for grants for 20,000 or less. I believe that uh, application deadline is November 1st, but the other uh, application deadlines are not until, uh, we, it's an ongoing process, but the, the closing date for applications is, March 31st of 2022. So there is an opportunity that we try to keep this program operating um, uh, throughout the year. I will note that these are competitive grants. So you will have to go through the process and it will go through a review and, and scoring piece. But we are, if the um, infrastructure bill that is currently being uh, debated and kicked around and moved through Congress uh, does come through, uh, rural development is looking at a substantial increase in the amount of funds that will, will be available for the REAP program uh, this fiscal year. So this, uh, I strongly feel that there's gonna be a lot of money here. Uh, there's a, a lot of different applications for that. So I wanna just give you a quick couple of project examples that we have funded through REAP that are specific to aquaculture. And I know that's probably a little bit small and hopefully we can share the PowerPoint, but um, we're a fish farmer, uh, used the REAP program to offset some of the costs for a oxygen sensor on the fish farm. Um, and there you go, and resulting, and this is just something where we measure that the, the upgrade in the equipment uh, will realize about $2,400 a year in savings. Another example is the installation of a solar power oxygen monitoring system at a catfish farm. Uh, and also uh, he, he used the REAP program to upgrade some of the HVAC and refrigeration uh, that served the operation. So there, he, there was a twofold, twofold um, uh, savings or improvement here by using REAP. And the last one, example I have for you is on a fishing vessel where the, again, they used it to um, upgrade some of the equipment there. And I thought this was kind of cool because they would no longer have to travel to get the slush ice because it's uh, going to be, you know, uh, they were able to get the equipment to have this in, and that was some added value to every pound of fish that they sold because they were doing it at a, a, um, um, at, at a lower cost. And again, this goes back to where we talked about rural development is looking to do uh, economic development. And so I think you've got three pretty good examples here. And uh, again, these, these are just three out of uh, a number that we've done through the brief.
the next program I want to talk to you about is our value add of producer grant program. This is also a competitive grant program that I believe will open in, I'm, don't hold me to it, but I believe our target date is to have this open to start accepting applications uh, next month in December. Uh, the value added program looks to work with agri agriculture producers of which um, fishermen would be meet that definition to enter into value added activities um, for the processing and marketing of, of new products or market or market expansion. Uh, again, the eligibility are independent producers, which could be fishermen, ag producer you know, groups, farmer, rancher, co-ops, and majority owned producer based business ventures. Uh, this program is somewhat unique that it uh, has two types of grants. It has a planning grant, which can be up to 75,000. Uh, these funds can be used uh, by a, a producer to do a feasibility study or uh, do a business plan for an operation. Uh, also has a second portion or a second grant within the program for working capital. And this can go up to $250,000. And this could be used to offset some of the costs on developing uh, new packaging, uh, you know, identifying new markets, getting a product into new markets. For value added, uh, there is again, competitive program. And for these grants, there is a dollar to dollar match. So if you come in for a $75,000 planning grant, you would have to uh, put up $75,000. And it sounds a little intimidating, yes, but it does not have to be all cash. It, there is a combination of cash and in-kind. Um, so it is something that is, is doable. And then I've just got a couple of examples of what we've done through um, value added in terms of the aquaculture sector. And the first one, just looking at um, working with a producer who was doing hot smoke processed eel and to use the value added working capital to identify some new markets, to um, expand the customer base for this product. Um, and it was uh, some diversification for them, adding into some more sustainability and resiliency for the business. Uh, another example was uh, a oyster farm. Uh, I believe this one was in Alabama. But again, it was just to, I think, again, it was working capital that was used to, uh, to build the market uh, and identify new customers uh, other than, say, direct marketing, selling to uh, local uh, seafood distributors and restaurants. And a final example here, again, is a um, land-based commercial scale um, steelhead trout facility. Um, working capital uh, grant that was used to help them uh, build and develop a, a new type of packaging. And this one in particular is targeted for, for holidays uh, that they were looking to, you know, they identified a market, um, were able to, or they will be able to, because I believe this is just actually a very recent one, but they targeted the holiday season. Um, uh, again, it's a you know, instead of just selling fish, they've, they've, you know, processed and packaged the fish. So it can be just an entree that can be the consumer can take at home. Uh, again, and I like this one too, because uh, through that investment that it was going to increase uh, or add four new jobs to that, that particular business. And these are, uh, those are just the two programs I have to have, I want to mention, again, out of that Portfolio 40, there could be other programs. Uh, again, if you're using a bigger facility, we have some guaranteed lending that we can help with some of the financing. I urge you to take a look at uh, the Rural Development website here. Uh, there is also the link to the you know, Find Your State Office. And then lastly, there is a link there that will kind of give you a um, lack of better words, a matrix or a listing or directory of the programs that rural development offers. It could just be something you want to take a look at. If you find something of interest or you have some questions, you could contact me. My email address is, is right there. Or again, I do encourage you to, uh, to make the connection with the RD state office in your area. And so, Nicole, that's wrapping up mine. And I, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Andy.
So I'm Tim Sullivan. I'm with USDA NIFA, where I serve as a national program leader for animal health and aquaculture. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about a few programs at NIFA that uh, relate to aquaculture and relate to beginning farmers. Um, but first, I'm going to just introduce what USDA NIFA is. So Andy mentioned rural development and, and it being one of uh, USDA's mission areas. NIFA is an agency within USDA and we are housed within the REE mission area, Research, Education and Economics. And we are the USDA's external grant making agency. So we, we make grant awards to private and public universities, to nonprofits, to small businesses around the US focused on research, education, and extension. So we make awards in those three areas to, with the goal of addressing critical issues to US agriculture, training in able-bodied and prepared educational workforce, and then taking the solutions that are developed on the research side and bringing them to stakeholders through various extension programs. As far as aquaculture producers go, the first program that I'm gonna highlight is the Small Business Innovative Research Program. Um, USDA runs one of eight SBIR programs. Uh, at NIFA, we have a program area priority specifically for aquaculture. It's open only to US-based small businesses. I'm the program contact and these slides will be available so you'll have my email address. And this program really focuses on developing new technologies that enhance the ex that enhance or enable the expansion of US aquaculture. So we focus on two broad areas. One is developing tools or resources to address critical needs to existing for existing aquaculture sectors. And the other is providing sort of seed funding to investigate the potential of new species for aquaculture expansion, and also the, the development of new production systems for either new aquaculture species or existing aquaculture species. So uh, this program makes awards in two phases. Phase one is an, uh, is an eight month project that is, has a maximum budget of $175,000. And this is really to generate preliminary data to test an idea. And uh, roughly half of the submissions we get each year are actually from producers around the country who have ideas for problems they routinely encounter in their own production or have ideas on ways to expand their current production system. So we make a number of awards each year to small businesses that are made up of actual aquaculture producers rather than just uh, researchers who have spinoff companies. Uh, people who are successful in phase one can then apply to phase two, which has a larger budget of up to $600,000 and a two year project duration. And this, this phase is really to develop the concept that was fleshed out in phase one, and also to develop a, a robust business plan that sort of situates the, the proposal in order to be able to go out and acquire uh, venture capital or other types of funding after the phase two award ends. The second program that I'm gonna talk about is the Regional Aquaculture Centers Program. This is about 30 years old. Uh, NIFA makes awards each year to five regional aquaculture centers. The North Central Center is headed by Joseph Morris at Iowa State University. The state of Ohio is within the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. And those centers have a mandate to support research, education, extension, and development projects. They make their own single and multi-year awards to address regionally important aquaculture issues. 
The majority of awards go to researchers in those various regions to address, like I said, regionally important aquaculture issues. But the reason I bring it up is it's a really good example of public-private partnership. And the centers themselves have industry advisory committees. So they, those committees are made up of producers from that region who really are a key part of identifying what those important issues are that the center then works to solicit research projects to address. So making contact with the folks at the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center is something that I would obviously recommend because the more they know what your issues are, the better they can work to try to help address them. And I'm also the contact for that program as well. The last of the programs I wanted to talk about is NIFA's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I'm actually not the contact for this program. It's uh, Dennis Ibadagi, and I provided his email as well. This program makes awards to extension uh, agents, nonprofits, sometimes for-profit companies with the goal of providing services that assist beginning farmers and ranchers to address sort of this whole long list of potential issues that a, a beginning farmer, a beginning producer might face. Um, while these grants don't go specifically to producers, they go to others who provide services for those people. I bring it up because there are a number of uh, regions and states that I know producers, especially aquaculture producers, have gotten together and sort of led the charge and gone and sought out groups and said, we want to have these services. And they've helped coordinate uh, submissions to this program to attain funding to then provide them resources to develop business plans or um, put on retraining programs. So it provides support for those kind of activities. And, you know, it, it supports both terrestrial and aquatic initiatives, but um, I think it's really impactful, especially when the producers have sort of been at the table from the very beginning. So if you're interested in that, if you know people you might wanna work with, you could definitely reach out to Dennis and he and his team can provide you additional information beyond the sort of high level overview that I just gave. So I didn't cover any specific projects in my quick overview, but I will point folks to uh, the CRIS database. So that's the link there. And when you type in chris.nifa.usda.gov, you're gonna get this webpage. If you go to assisted search, you can type in a keyword. So if you're an aquaculture producer, you could put in aquaculture or you could put in yellow perch, oyster, anything. And that system will bring up all projects funded by USDA NIFA across all of our programs. And you can go through and sort by year and look at the topics and look at what programs they came from. That's a really good way to then identify other program contacts and potentially new ideas and reach out to people with questions. So I would, uh, I know the slides will be shared with you also, but that's something I would point out. If you go to Chris and you, you take a look, you might find things that are interesting for you. So that's all I have. I think we can turn it back to questions now. Thank you, Tim and Andy, Joan and Steve. Um, we will turn it over to questions. We have a few questions for you, Andy, first. Um, if you wanna put your, can have everyone join us with their videos on. Um, first, does rural development support businesses engaging in farming in urban settings? How is rural defined by your organization? Um, I'll start with the last. Uh, particularly, there's multiple definitions, regrettably, but uh, for business, we, we typically, our definition of rural is cities or towns of 50,000 or less. 
uh, for the two programs that I talked about, uh, the fact of, you know, and so typically we will work in, in rural. However, when you do have a program like REAP or, or a value-added producer grant program, the eligibility for that program for the applicant is, are they a producer? So if they can meet the definition of producer by USDA's producer, which I believe is just having revenues of $1,000 you know, annually, uh, we can work in rural, uh, urban areas. So, you know, conceivably a value-added producer grant, value-added producer grant award could go to a um, rooftop garden in, uh, you know, Chicago or New York City. If they could demonstrate the, you know, the viability of the product or project and that they are a producer. Thank you. And I realize we're a little bit over time, but we have a few questions if folks can, can stay on here with us. Um, another one, it seems like a lot of the deadlines for this year have passed. Are these various programs um, pretty stable year to year or do they fluctuate with appropriations? Um, I'll start and, and Tim can join in there too. I think most of ours are pretty stable. Um, you know, we tried to, we've been trying to get on a schedule that will be, you know, amenable to the people in the audience. Uh, we're trying to get to the point where it comes October 1, uh, the start of a new fiscal year, we can get programs open. And again, a lot of it is, as people know, you know we are currently running under a continuing continuing resolution. We don't have our strong uh, appropriation numbers yet. But uh, most of these programs, particularly in rural development, are, are popular. And you know, while we do, we are subject to the appropriations uh, you know, throughout my career, which has been um, probably lengthier than I thought it would be. Uh, we've, we've always ended up with funding for these programs. And what I would also you know, encourage people to do is, is keep your eye, you, know, you don't have to be a policy one, but pay attention to some of these uh, like the infrastructure bill or some of these other build back better bills that are coming out there. There's uh, you know, the potential for some significant funding streams that are going to be coming out there. And some of it, you know, particularly looking into the food supply chains and I'm looking on building the uh, resiliency of the U.S. food supply chain, of which seafood and aquaculture would be a part of. So if I were to jump in, I'm, as far as NIFA goes, we are generally stable year to year. Over the last five years, we've moved most of our deadlines up with the hope that if anything would happen, we would move a deadline back because we've been delayed by appropriation. But that way, you know, we can always understand that in, you know, after the fiscal year, we're going to start having the same deadlines for every program every year. That's sort of, we did that as a mechanism in order to help our stakeholders sort of understand and not have to worry about tracking that year in and year out. That's sort of my bit on that. Okay. And next, finally, um, final question for you, Andy. Would AgriSolar qualify for the Rural Energy Program? I'm not sure. I, I don't know AgriSolar. Is there a definite, I mean, just sounding on what it is, uh, you know, solar definitely is, uh, and we've done a lot of uh, financing and investments into the solar space. So again, I'm, pardon me for my ignorance, I'm not sure I know what agro solar is, but um, I'm just going to use my brain here and I, I'm assuming to say yes, I do believe it would be. Okay, and I think Theo, if that if you're still on and you want to clarify anything, please add that and we'll ask them again. Um, next for Joan, can you give an example of a train the trainer grant? Yes. So for example, if if an extension educator wanted to put on a training for other extension educators on a topic having to do with aquaculture, maybe it's best practices, or maybe it's a, an innovation that has come along and they wanna train other educators, they could apply for one of those professional development grants to train other trainers. So it's training other educators. Okay, thank you. Um, we've mostly been talking about, well, here in the, in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes region, 
um, we're talking about land-based aquaculture, but are these programs equally available to, to marine aquaculture and land-based aquaculture operations? Yeah, I can. So as far as NIFA goes, we we follow the National Aquaculture Act, which didn't really, which doesn't distinguish, it doesn't delineate between freshwater and marine aquaculture as far as production. So that's what that's where we we include both because that's what's both what's included in the NAA. And I would uh, be agreeing there with Tim. I think we're you know where the challenge we would have if it was say a port or something that was in a um, heavily populated area that may not be opportunity, but rural development could go through if you were say up in Alaska or someplace here and you're looking to buy vessels, you know, to buy a fleet to finance some boats or some equipment like this. Yes, we could do that. Okay, um, this next question is probably for Steve and or Andy. Um, one of the development obstacles for aquaculture business development is the lack of regional food feed mills. Is there funding available to support the start of a micro feed mill plant that could be scaled up as new producers come online? Um, I'll take first crack at that. I would say the answer is yes. I mean, again, that uh, some of the um, associated activities with um, with an enterprise that I think rural development could do. I think we look at some of that as the as a, uh, a system wide or it could even be a cluster. If there were you know fishermen here and what are all the other you know necessary businesses that could be there? You fish, okay, you're going to bring it in. You need to aggregate, process, clean, market, uh, but also the uh, on the food side there. So I think if it was within our you know quote operational space, we could definitely do a you know, you know, like a feed mill or of something that it was specific and micro. Uh, I mean, we don't say it has to be, you know, mega, you know, there. And in some cases, smaller um, may be better because it could be easier to just get the financing. Steve, is there anything you could add there? No, I, I, I would agree that there should be financing available for those type of facilities. It's going to be based on, you know, that business plan for that feed mill and, and the number of participants that be able to produce feed for and so forth. If I, so if I could jump in real quick, if, if you're, if you're the idea of the feed mill, if you're, if you're, producing the feed in a novel way, I would also say you could apply to an SBIR type program. Yeah. We have a, we have an awardee right now who is on the, the northeastern coast and they their project is the development of a mobile oyster hatchery because it was, you know, there were areas along the coast where they didn't have access to reliable hatchery spat. They had to travel too far to get it to their farm, so they developed a mobile hatchery, and that was something that they're they're in phase two now, working on that project. So, those kind of things you could also think about SBIR for. Just throwing it out. Okay. Um, one kind of a general question. Um, when it comes to grants, what grants are available to, to up and coming or new fish farmers and what would be the requirements for that? So it seems like most of the grants are um, either you know, more aimed at problem solving or um, innovation, but are there any that apply to new farmers or would they be looking at more of um, loans? Well, I think you would go back to some of the beginning farmer grants that uh, or programs that USDA offers. I was remiss in noting, too, that in our, say, for example, our value-added producer grant program, there are several priorities there, one of which being a um, you know, new or beginning farmer or rancher. So if you have, uh, you meet that qualification, say you've had a fishing operation or uh, for, you know, 10 years or less, you could uh, qualify for that priority, which in some of these competitive grant programs, this is significant. If you start out with a few extra points in that score, um, it's, um, it, it's important and it's very beneficial. Now, again, that's not a grant to get started. 
but if you, you know, were still and you, you say you already did get started, but you're looking to now advance or build on your business, there are some of these, uh, you know, uh, priorities that do target beginning and um, uh, small and beginning farmers. And, um, and uh, Nicole, I'll just say there too, because just, you know, for the audience, you know, you have, you uh, um, Tim, Joan, and uh, myself out here, we're representing RD, NIFA, and um, SARE. Uh, you know, take a look at some of the other programs. You know, I think others mentioned here too with the Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resource Conservation, uh, and particularly on some of the value added type things there is, is look at the programs that Agricultural Marketing Service does. It's a uh, USDS, a very, very broad, uh, very big. We cover, you know, from soup to nuts. So um, I think there are some efforts and Tim and I are part of a couple other aquaculture initiatives that, you know, we're working with uh, in the department, even with the Ag Research Service. And I think one of our goals is trying to come up with a, uh, uh, some information that will be useful if we could consolidate the types of programs across the department that are applicable to aquaculture. And I'll add one more as people may also want to check with their State Department of Agriculture because sometimes they do have programs that support new producers too. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so along those lines, um, someone says the other bottleneck for fish production around the Great Lakes is the loss of fish processors. Are there grants for training processors and funding processing plants? Uh, that's that's another good question. I mean, uh, again, I focused on two programs within our our portfolio. There are programs where we have grants that could go to, say, a university or a nonprofit that could be used for workforce development. They could be used for other types of training. You know, they could be used to establish a um, business incubator, a uh, business accelerator, you know, type program. And again, it's uh, that's not directly to the fishermen or to the business that will be working through, you know, essentially more, you're more likely a, a state organization, um, a, a nonprofit or, or a university, but could be delivering a lot of that uh, technical assistance type training. And those also, those are grants. Um, let's see, I'm going to read this one and hopefully it makes sense. <laughs> Would it be preferable for a new farmer with no farmstead yet to apply for a loan with experience from other fish farms and have their research of current trends with aquaculture when they go to a financial advisor specializing in the field? I think I get what they're talking about there. We've seen some of that on the um, on the land based agriculture, where um, I guess you would have like a, a student mentor relationship, where there has been a existing farmer who's who's out there, and somebody is either maybe it's going to transition, maybe they're going to sell that farm to a new farmer. But there is, and I and to some extent, yeah, I think it is beneficial. Uh, it is challenging on anything else that you've got to convince that lender that you have, and I think it goes back to what Stephen says, is like, you've got to prove the economics. You know, you've got to have a sound uh, business plan, feasibility study, and even maybe before getting into there is looking at some of these programs that could finance, you know, some of that feasibility study work or, or developing a very strong business plan. That's what's going to help you going in to get the financing for, um, for the land or equipment that you're going to need. Right. Um, so we want to wrap up here. Um, you know, access to land is an issue for aquaculture, just as it is in other types of agricultural operations. Do any of these um, financing or funding opportunities cover um, purchasing land or leasing land? Uh, again, the programs I mentioned would not cover land, but however, we have a program and it's a, it's a loan guarantee program. It's called the Business and Industry Guaranteed Loan Program, but it can be used for the acquisition of some land. Uh, a lot of the farmland uh, purchases are, are going to be through at USDA are going to be through the Farm Services Agency. 
but there could be. I mean, I, on some part, parts, there is, um, you know, get creative. There could be some existing business out there now where you could arrange. You know, there could be a lease. There could be a some sort of collaborative relationship that uh, the the owner of the land with something now sees the value of leasing it out to. Uh, you know, fish tanks. Maybe there are some syner you know, synergistic enterprises there that could work. So again, I think this goes back to what we're saying. I mean, you hopefully we've given you some thought is reach out to some of the contacts that have been shared here today and, and, and talk with a USDA person, you know, come up with an idea. I think you'll find that most folks here at USDA will be, you know, will sit down and work with you to try to find a solution to, you know, what you're trying to do. Yeah, good advice. Well, thank you to all of our speakers today. We are going to wrap things up. Um, I would definitely um, suggest that everyone do develop those relationships with your state or regional contacts for these programs. Also reach out to your sea grants and land grant institutions um, extension. We're always here to support you as well. Um, I'll give our speakers if you want to have any last <laughs> parting thoughts that you'd give to our audience members, and then we can uh, sign off for the day. No, other than good luck. I mean, I, I just, I really do encourage you to, you know, to look, to make those contacts. They're far more important uh, than you may think is, uh, you know, to get connected with that local person and, you know, and, and don't, you know, honest God, don't, don't take no for an answer, you know, just, just keep coming and, you know, to them. And uh, again, I just wish everybody there the best of luck in their um, endeavors. And uh, for the SARE grants, I just wanted to mention that there are no matching funds required. So if, if people wanted to try out a project, you know, on a small scale and then see if they could make it larger or, you know, trying something new and innovative, you could explore a SARE grant. You can't purchase land with SARE grant funds, but you can rent land if needed for the grant project. Okay, good to know. Okay, and with that, this recording will be available in one to two weeks, along with all the presentations, and we will compile all of the links and resources shared into one handy document, <laughs> so you don't have to scroll through everything if you don't want to. So thanks again, everyone, for your time, both speakers and audience members, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Nicole. Everybody, good evening. Bye. Thank you, everyone.